Hi. Welcome to Swift and the N-Body Problem. My name is Daniel, and I'm really happy to tell you stuff about celestial dynamics today. Celestial dynamics, or celestial mechanics, is the science of calculating and predicting the paths that the sun, the moon, galaxies, so any celestial bodies will take across the sky. It's a fun story, and like all fun stories, it started with a huge mistake. You see, 2,000 years ago, when scientists first created models for the Earth and how it would interact with any celestial bodies, they placed the Earth in the center. So, of course, the Sun and the other, say, five available planets had to revolve around the Earth. This is called the, so this is called the geocentric model. That leads us to some weird paths that the planet has to take, because sometimes, they, from our viewpoint, they seem to go backwards and then forwards again. But, you know, you've got to have some priorities in your life, and these were theirs. This is early astrologist and habitual mansplainer Claudius Ptolemaeus, and he took some records of celestial observations from the Babylonians and combined them into this mathematical model that used epicycles, that is like cycles within cycles, uh, to describe the planetary orbits in a geometric way. And this geocentric model was the accepted wisdom in Europe until the Middle Ages. But there were people who worked out a heliocentric model way earlier than that. This is Greek mathemati mathematician and fartrope aficionado Aristarchus of Samos, who lived around 310 BC. He produced one of the first heliocentric models that we know of. Using that, he also accurately predicted the distance of the Earth from the Sun, and he found an explanation for the missing stellar par parallax. A bit later, Aristarchus' calculations were confirmed and extended by mathematician, astronomer, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan, Hypatia of Alexandria. Who, she lived around 350 AD. And was, she was a huge deal in, in Alexandria, in Egypt at the time. She was famous for her philosophy, for her mathematics, for her astronomics. She created these astrolabes, these... Um, these models, like these mechanical models of like how planets revolve around each other. But the sad thing is, like I could talk for an hour about, about her because she's really awesome, but the sad thing is most of her documents have been lost to history. And also, her writings never quite arrived in the European scientific uh, community. I have, I have an idea why. Okay, Middle Ages. This is mathematician, astronomer, and inventor of the duck face selfie, Nicolaus Copernicus, <laughs> who in 1543 published his own heliocentric model, repeating the findings of Aristarchus and Hypatia. So, in Copernicus's heliocentric model, he places the sun in the middle, and then he places these concentric circles around the sun, and places the planets on top of them. So, these are perfect, perfect circles. And this was kind of the start of modern astronomy in Europe. So, the Copernican model, uh, from its publication onwards, people were not super convinced that it was actually a good model. They were, they were saying stuff like, okay, the, the mathematical model is sound, and it also is cool because it, it has an explanation for the seasons, because the Earth's axis is tilted relative to its orbit. But they... The stars, they would have to be huge. And also, like, why would the Earth move? Like, I don't, I don't feel it move, right? And also, keep in mind, they didn't have a concept of gravity back then, so they couldn't imagine of a force that would just move such a huge body as the Earth just on its own. So, half a century after him came Johannes Kepler, here shown trying to eat sushi for the first time. <laughs> And Kepler used Tycho Brahe's observation of the position and time of Mars and built a model that would explain Mars's movement. To do that, he extended the Copernican model so that also the Sun would be in the middle, but instead of perfect circles, he placed ellipses around them, where the Sun is always in one of the two foci of a planet's orbital ellipses, and if 
we are looking at a moon that circles a, that circles a planet, then the planet would be always in the f one of the two foci of the ellipse. And by the way, if anyone is playing Kerbal Space Program here, this is exactly the model that this game uses to calculate orbits. Next up is crowd pleaser and absolute lover of human intimacy, Sir Isaac Newton. Newton tried to use geometry to predict the planet's motions, and he failed because he discovered a few more objects because he built his own telescopes and he was kind of good at it, so he had way more accurate data, and he just couldn't match up what he saw with Kepler's and Copernicus's models. And so he realized that there is actually a gravitational interaction between planets and that is affecting their orbits. So he says in the, in the solar system, every planet is gravitational, gravitationally affected by all the other planets in the solar system and also outside of the solar system. And this was new. This was exciting because suddenly, you don't have a geometric model anymore. This is basically calculus. So just like that, you have a completely new universal law. And this law looks like this. The force of gravity between two bodies is proportional to their masses multiplied divided by their distances squared. This says is proportional because Newton was missing a constant in there that was later discovered by Carl Friedrich Gauss. But the principle sound, like the Apollo mission used Newtonian physics to calculate their orbits to plot their courses to the moon. And this is also really cool because it models the interactions between all the bodies. Say, say you want to find and yet undiscovered planet nine out there, far away from the sun, so it's super dark. What you do is you look at the motion of known bodies and plug all of this into a Newtonian model of the solar system and find the discrepancies. And then you construct yourself a virtual body and place it in an orbit that would explain all these discrepancies just by its existence. And this is how you know where to exit, exactly point your telescopes. And by the way, for Planet Nine, we are actually in the pointing telescopes phase. It's easy to calculate the gravitational interactive forces between two bodies using Newtonian physics. But as soon as there are more, things get harder to predict. This is because everybody's gravity influences all the other bodies' orbital parameters, which in turn influences all the other bodies. So for n bodies, you have n squared interactions. And why is this bad? Let's have a quick aside, and I'm going to tell you about big O notation. In computer science, most of you will know this, in computer science, big O notation is used to classify algorithms according to how their running time or space requirements grow as their input, input size grows. The letter O is used because the growth rate of a function is also referred to as the order of a function. So this is a graph where I, put, where, where I plotted a few different growth rates. And the difference doesn't seem so terrible, right? I mean, like, n squared is up there, but like, n log n is in, in, in there. But this is just for t n, n equals 10. So for, if we go up to 100 or even 1,000, you see that n squared is a pretty bad thing for algorithms because the growth rate is just immense here. So, back to the n-body problem. This is a very quick algorithmic solution to the n-body problem. We loop through all the bodies, and for each of those bodies, we loop through all the other bodies and apply a accelerate function, which is basically Newton's gravitational formula. Now, Whenever we call, whenever we want to calculate all, the, all this acceleration, we have between n bodies, we have to do n squared calls to accelerate. And this gets very expensive very quickly. Enter Pete Hutt and Josh Barnes, who just couldn't let this n squared stuff stand. They wanted to simulate what it looks like when large galaxies collide. And they were busy people, and they didn't have a year's time to wait for their simulations to complete. 
I don't have a picture of Josh Barnes, but this is Pete Hutt. He looks like he's about to drop the hottest hip-hop album in astrophysics this year. <laughs> And he is pretty interesting. He does research in computer simulations of large and dense stellar systems, but he also has interdisciplinary collaborations with natural science, computer science, cognitive psychology, and philosophy. He also has, a, he also has an asteroid named after him, asteroid 17031 Pete Hutt. And he's the co-founder of the B612 Foundation, which focuses on the prevention of asteroid impacts on Earth. So, thanks, Pete Hutt. Barnes and Hutt wrote a paper in 1986 in which they describe an algorithm to calculate a solution to the n-body problem in n times log n time, which is a whole lot better than n squared time, of course. So what they describe is they add another preparation step before they actually run their calculation or simulation step. And in this preparation step, they take all the bodies they have in their system and organize them into a tree structure. And in each of these tree nodes that are not at the very bottom, they save a virtual body that consists of all the bodies that are below them combined into a single virtual body that has like a combined position and mass. And using this, I can just take like a, if I have a very far away body, I don't have to go down all the way into the tree because if it's very far away, I will just use the virtual body. This works because Imagine there's a galaxy far, far away that, you, that is influencing me with its gravity right now. Because it's so far away, it might consist of like a billion suns and planets and particles and spaceships and whatever, but the influence that, that I feel or experience would be exactly the same if it was just like one huge metal ball. And so this works pretty well. Now, I want to go with you through the preparation algorithm for a little bit. So this is our starting field of uh, bodies. And in the lower left, we have a, a bit of space. So here I'm going to show you what the tree looks like. So the barnes algorithm always asks itself, is the current quadrant that I'm looking at, does it have more than one body? And in this case, we're looking at the whole thing, so it does indeed. So what we do is we create a virtual body. In this case, it's our root node for our tree. And we split up the quadrants. This, by the way, is two, 2D, so it's four quadrants. You can do it in 3D with eight quadrants, but this is easier to show. So now we look at the upper left one. And again, we ask ourselves, is there one more than one body? And in fact, there is. So we split up some more after creating a node, right? And again, we look, we look one step deeper. Is there more than one body? I see you nodding, yes, yes, okay. So create a node, split it up, and finally we arrive at a depth where there's actually one single body in this quadrant. And at this point we just save this body into the tree directly. And then we go on to the next one. Here is nothing, so we save a nil value. Same here. And then we have this one, which is also just one body, so we save it into the tree. And like this, We go through all the, the whole system. We go as deep as we need to go. And we, um, we, we create this tree. We will throw it away at the end of the simulation step and recreate a new one. Uh, but this tree will really help. And at the, as I said on the way, every time we, we put another body in there, we, we update the virtual bodies to account for their combined mass and position, right? So once we have the tree and we actually want to simulate this, what we do is like this is, like I hold in my hand a body right now and I want to look at which forces does this body experience. So I take the tree and I go through the tree depth first and at each node I ask myself, is this detailed enough? Or this formula basically. So at the root node, I'm like, okay, this is probably not detailed enough. So I go down one further. This is probably also not detailed enough. So I go down one more. But let's say this is detailed enough. Let's say this thing is true that is at the bottom of the slide. So instead of going down even further, I just look at this virtual body. Then I, then I skip this one because it's nil. Then I, use at this, then I look at this actual body. And then I look at this actual body. And just like that, I have finished a whole quarter of the tree in a very, very short time. Because this is, in this example, the tree is very shallow, but it would be like hundreds of level deep, levels deep, obviously. So enough of the 
chit chat, let's look, let's look at some code. I'm not going to make you look at my whole code, it's on GitHub, but um, because it felt right, I created, I created an object-oriented structure around this. Um, Barnes & Hutt did it in a functional way, but so I have a body ob object, it has position, velocity, and mass, basically, and it has methods to give me the distance to another body and to update it. Updating in this context means just move it along its velocity vector for a given amount of time. And I also have an accelerate function that takes one body and adds the, the force vector created by the gravitational influence of another body to its velocity vector. And this uses Newtonian physics. So this is where Newton comes in again. And one more thing, like we will see this later again. Um, Barnes Hutt doesn't change this accelerate function. Barnes Hutt only changes how often this accelerate function has to be called, right? Okay, next thing is BH tree. This is my Barnes Hutt tree node and also connection to the up to four subtrees. It saves a body that might be a virtual body, it saves this quadrant, and it also has an insert method that will, where I plug in a body and then it will just like fall down updating all the virtual bodies on the way until it finds a leaf. So this is, this is where the splitting up happens. And I also created a system which basically is just a container for all the bodies that I have. It also has a size, so I know how big to construct my first quadrant. And I've given my systems a solar mass because I like how it looks when bodies just revolve around the central sun, but this is not strictly necessary. Systems have an update function, and this is where we have two implementations. Um, this deals with like updating all the individual bodies and updating their velocity vectors, right? So we have a brute force implementation, we've seen that before, and we also have a barnes hut implementation. You've seen the brute force before. This is how the original acceleration algorithm used by Barnes & Hutt looks like. It's written in Scheme, a variant of Lisp, so not the brackets and the prepended function names. This is how my version looks like. And one thing, like there's a lot of complexity hidden there, of course, like because the tree dot accelerate, that's the whole, that's the whole like select the virtual bodies or the proper bodies from the tree and whatever. So this takes some time, right? But what you really wanna wanna take home from this is we've taken the loop from loop inside a loop structure, and now we have two loops next to each other, and this is way better, of course. And you can see this when you actually plot a few bodies around a a sun or whatever and calculate the interactions, that the barnes algorithm really, like the more bodies you have, the more difference between the speeds you will see. And you can also see this in numbers, like for very small numbers of bodies, brute force is actually faster because it doesn't have to deal with creation of the tree. But as soon as you go to any proper number of bodies that you want to calculate, like brute force just it dies. So this is about the most bodies that my laptop here can render live. It's around 200 bodies, I think, and I've just distributed them randomly. And the larger ones get trails, the, the tinier ones don't get trails because otherwise this would look very messy. This is done using SpriteKit. So SpriteKit is super easy. You should really check it out. Um, you can, like, all my code is on GitHub. So check it out, play around with it. If you've never used SpriteKit, you will be uh, amazed. Like this is 100 lines on top of the Burns Hut code. Now, we have, uh, we have now seen how to, how to calculate orbits and how gravitational interaction works. So the next thing I want to do with you is just play around, like how do we actually navigate in space, like we are in orbit somewhere, how do we get to where we wanna, wanna go, right? So, first misconceptions that I really wanna clear up is launches. Like many people think that just because I go up 400 kilometers, just like straight up, that I'm suddenly weightless. And this is untrue, like 400 kilometers up, this is the height of where the International Space Station uh, orbits. We, you still experience 99% of gravity, so in this case, you would just fall down again. So what you do instead is you launch sideways. And as you go sideways, you accelerate more and more until you find yourself like in this, in this sideways 
circle around the Earth. This is your orbit. And this works because there is still, there's still all this gravity pulling you down, but there's also, you've accelerated to, for the Earth, seven kilometers per second. And this force pulls you sideways, and these two vectors combine to bring you into this smooth circle. So this is how any orbit works. And now, how do I influence this orbit? So basically, oh yeah, this is cool. Like, this is how an actual rocket launch looks like, right? This is uh, last year, some SpaceX launch. So, how do I influence my orbit? What I do is, whatever I do, it influences the opposite side of my, of my orbit. If I accelerate, my, the opposite side rises. If I decelerate, the opposite side lowers. If I go sideways, you, I change my inclination, but that's advanced. So, for example, here we have a very eccentric orbit, and maybe we are returning from Mars or the Moon or whatever. So, what we want to do here is we want to we want to lower this orbit. So we wait until we are at the lowest point of the orbit. We turn our ship around. So now that our engines are pointing into our direction of travel. Now we fire our engines, and wh what happens is that the highest point, which is the opposite point at this point, will go down, go down, go down, go down, go down, go down, and then. We are in a circle, but we don't stop firing our engines at this point. Instead, we lower the opposite side of our orbit even more until it actually dips into the atmosphere. And at this point, we can deactivate our engines and just coast on. And here, I really hope you brought some heat shields because we are slamming into the atmosphere at seven kilometers per hour. So things like air particles are ionized and like release a lot of heat just like against the hull of our ship. And this drag uh, lowers our speed even more, so this lowers our orbit, of course. So we're going down, 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 down. And at this, at this point, like, maybe we have parachutes or we have grid fins and they open and the landing legs come out and the ground gets closer and closer and closer and closer and you land and you are home. Thank you very much, Daniel. Daniel, Daniel, we have time for a couple of questions. If someone right. is interested to ask a question about or orbital dynamics and so on and so forth, there is a question over there. So, did you compare how it works in real life in NASA? How does it do it? in comparison with your algorithm? Um, you mean like the Barnsard algorithm versus like brute forcing? I mean, how do they uh, calculate real astronauts when they it, launch real it rockets? It kind of it depends. Like, um, for, I, I would say, like, I, I don't have exact numbers, but I would say that most uh, space agencies would like use Barnsard or something similar 90% of the time, and then use a combination of complete brute force, Newtonian physics, and maybe even Einsteinian physics for the very, very detailed stuff. But for example, moon landings, they, they would, pro like for the moon landings, what they did was they just looked at a few bodies, they looked at the Earth, the moon, the spacecraft, and maybe Mars or something. So th what they did was even uh, even less fidelity version. So we had even less fidelity than Barnes Hutt, and it still worked out pretty well because um, uh, as you've seen before, like the, the gravitational interactions decreases with the square of distance, so it decre decreases very strongly. So for most human stuff, it's probably okay. But if you want to like, if you want to do whole galaxies colliding, then Barnes had a super awesome. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah. There is another one. Just a toy question. Did you uh, put in the Einsteinian model as well? And no. Did you see? Oh, okay. I'm not. I'm not smart enough. Like this was. This was like my t my goal here was to do like exactly the other way, like way around. Like how can I make this easier to calculate to show how I can use tree structures and other things to be more more quick quicker in our apps too. Okay. Then thank you very much again. Thank you.